Also in the news, um, we are very pleased to announce that on the next show, uh, we're going to be joined by Zomgitz Chris. And sometime, the one person that I think, well, myself uh, in particular, I think also uh, Aaron and, uh, and the others, desperately wanted on the show. Who is the one person we've been trying to get for literally years and has never appeared? Anyone want to guess? Potholer 54. There we go. Potholer 54. He will be on the show. We're not entirely sure when. It will not be before early June because he's traveling all over the place. Um, but once he's back at home sometime after, the, I think it's the 6th of June, uh, we will be uh, getting Potholer 54 on. So those are two uh, things to look forward to. And as ever, if you want to see some particular person on the show uh, or a particular topic being discussed, then send any one of us a message. Or, um, you can do it through the website, which now you can go to just by clicking on the link um, above the video box. And uh, we, do, um, we do welcome comments, criticisms, observations and the like. Uh, we're going to kick off today with um, Thunderfoot, and those of you who may have seen his most recent video, which was only posted an hour or so ago, uh, will have heard him mentioning um, the Hadron Collider and what will happen if you put your hand into the Hadron Collider. Um, we're kicking off with that, but that is not necessarily the topic. Um, anything goes, as ever. So, uh, as I say, send a contact request in, and we'll see where we get to. Thunder, explain the reason why you're doing this video, because there was, there was another channel called 60 Symbols. You might want to explain a bit about them and the comments they made uh, in relation to this issue. I mean, I don't actually have that much problem with the response that the 60 Symbols guys gave. I mean, these are the sorts of responses that you might get out of a, you know, sort of any university physics department for an off-the-cuff response. The problem was is that they were terribly unenlightening in that they gave arguably every answer that you could possibly give to the question. Some said it would sort of rip your hand off. Others said it would just burn a hole in your hand. Um, and then they went to the people at the Large Hadron Collider, um, who it seemed to me, uh, yeah, yeah, they, they talked to the particle physicists. And really, this isn't a particle physicist question. This is a question that you would ask to the guy in charge of um, radiation safety, radiological safety. Uh, so um, I also found their answers um, uh, fairly lacking. I mean, so in order to understand what damage the Large Hadron Collider would actually do to your hand, you need to know uh, several things. First of all, you need to have an idea of how radiation actually interacts with uh, your body. And there are only sort of two forces that will primarily interact with. The first is the, the electromagnetic. That's the sort of force that holds the electrons to the nuclei. And the second one is the strong nuclear force, which is what actually holds the nuclei together. Now, your chances of actually getting your, your proton that's coming through to hit um, a nucleus are very small, because the nuclei are very small. And also, uh, if, if your um, protons were traveling relatively slowly, they tend to get repelled because both the nucleus and the protons from the Large Hadron Collider are both positive, they tend to get repelled. So it's actually normally quite hard to hit the nuclei. Now, with the Large Hadron Collider's case, of course, these things are traveling at virtually the speed of light. Um, so it's a sort of... Um, uh, almost um, a linear probability of hitting the nucleus, but seeing as the nucleus is tiny, your chance of hitting the nucleus is very small. Um, and seeing as you're traveling so near the speed of light, you you, the, the, the amount of time, the time window you actually have to interact is is reduced. So the, the bottom line is that, ironically, the faster the particles move, um, they actually dump less proportional amounts of energy into whatever matter they're traveling through. And this is sort of obvious if you think about it. In the shielding that you need for these particles gets progressively more and more. Yeah, if you want to shield from very high energy particles, you need much more matter to actually absorb that energy. Now, that can only be the case because um, it doesn't interact with the matter as strongly. So, you know, now if you put your hand into the Large Hadron Collider beam, how much damage would you do? Well, I mean, um, 
my gut response is there might be a little singe on the very edge of your hand, but beyond that, there would be essentially no damage. Um, I mean, it, as far as I can tell, it takes several hours to actually build up full beam on the Large Hadron Collider. And it's going at virtually the speed of light, which means that the particles have enough um, velocity on them to travel from, say, Earth to the moon in about a second, which means that if you try to lower your hand into the beam, it'll actually go, even, even if they only very weakly interact with your hand, um, they will do it many times before you can actually move your hand into the beam. Um, and my reckoning is that seeing as you're so near the end, the, the speed of light, now this is the bit where I don't have the technical expertise, but um, any interaction with your hand whatsoever will mean that you will lose beam confinement on that proton. So each proton only gets to interact with one particle in your hand before it's considered dead. And seeing as the recharge rate is about two hours, um, you only have to interact with each particle in the beam once before the entire beam is crashed. So my reckoning is that you would maybe get about a millimeter scorch on the very edge of your hand, and that would kill the beam completely. I mean, this is ignoring all the practicalities that you can't actually put your hand into the beam because it runs in a vacuum. And you can very easily do the calculations that if you were to open the beam and try and put your hand in, the beam would be dead long before you could actually, you, know, you just can't move fast enough as a human. Uh, you wouldn't be able to open the port and put your hand in. The beam would be dead long before that happened. But so you, you could put your planning. hand, you could put, have your hand sealed into the tunnel somehow. With a yeah, you put a, you, you put a space suit on and you get into the tunnel, basically. Yeah. So, you know, don't, you can't avoid the question that way. So I assume that you've done that. You're still saying that it will do minimal damage. So I, I just um, assumed, Thunder, that you were going to be doing like a live demo where you yourself would jump in front of the beam because I was really <laughs> hoping for the, the backstory for a new X-Men. You know, uh, yeah. I don't know, Thunderfoot is already a pretty good superhero name. I don't know what your powers would be, but they'd be something really Ironically, the video starts with that exact thought. You know, <laughs> Dr. Da Dr. David Banner, how does he get his special powers? By being exposed to gamma radiation. <laughs> it's like um no uh gamma radiation will will mess you up um you really don't want to get exposed to it but i mean because this is actually in a nice confined beam um and because it keeps going around in a circle uh you you, you can't get your hand into the beam um you just can't move quick enough what about like uh cascade effect i know like if you're working with a beta source, you're never supposed to use lead because it produces that secondary radiation, the Bremsstrahlung uh, radiation, right? This, yeah, this is going um, back quite a ways. I know we worked with radioactive phosphorus quite a bit, and you have to use plexiglass rather than mm -hmm. lead to avoid that. That uh, It actually generates high-energy gamma, uh, which can be more destructive than oh. the beta itself. Yeah, this is going well over this is going well over my head, so I know it's going over, over some of these other people's heads too. So I just want to rope it in just a little bit. The reason that we're getting so many vague questions from the or vague answers rather from the scientific community is because we haven't answered the question or we haven't asked the question properly. If we were to have asked instead, what if we had a puppy and we put it on a leash and we hung it from the leash in the middle of the hadron collider? Then what would happen? Then I think you'd get much more desperate, much more assertive answers. We also have firebombing from the amplified <laughs> groups. 